Welcome to the Citizens Band Radio Hour. Thoughtful conversations that explore issues of media and journalism, democracy and citizenship. The Citizens Band Radio Hour is sponsored by the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. You can visit the center online at mediaandcitizenship.org. Here's your host, Coy Barefoot. Help me welcome to the program my friend, the former chief of police of the city of Charlottesville, Tim Longo, is live in studio. It's good to see you, sir. I'm glad you're here. Coy, thanks so much. It's been a really long time to sit across the table with you, and you've been missed, my friend. I, I was hope you're well. just thinking, I am, thank you. I was just thinking as I was driving over here, I don't know when's the last time you were on this program, but I know it's been a while, and I know for a fact it's been before the events of last August. Yeah, sure. So was. this is, even though this is now almost February of 2018, you and I have not had a chance to discuss publicly, at least, um, the the events, the tragic, sad, ugly events of last summer that regrettably put Charlottesville on the, on the front pages again for all the wrong reasons. And you know what that's like. I sure do. Uh, having yeah, having sure been do. there, you know, for the search for Hannah Graham and Rolling Stone and and on and on and on. Um, can, can we just go back and just share your thoughts as you look back now with uh, a few months distance and some time to really reflect? And let me begin that. Just preface your remarks by saying, Tim, I can't tell you how many people I ran into personally who told me to my face or commented on Facebook, gosh, I wish Tim Longo was still here. I wish, which of course, you're still here. You're still a resident of the city and, you know, raising your kids here. But they were like, I wish Tim was still the chief of police. Where's Tim Longo when you need him? And I'm sure you heard a lot of that uh, commentary directly. What do you think about when you think about what happened, what crosses your mind? A lot of things, a lot of, um, a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, disappointment, um, anger, frustration. Um, you know, it's hard, and I, I've I've said this to folks, and it's certainly not to diminish the the tragedy that that happened in August. But I, I you know, I sat on the sidelines. Uh, from my front porch, just about two thirds of a mile from where all that happened, um, as if I were a retired coach of some sort who wanted so desperately to be on the field again with his team, uh, trying to help through difficult times. Um, I told Brooke Baldwin uh, on CNN the following Monday, "It's not for me to criticize um, for a planning that I was not part of, or for events that I I I weren't I was not present for." I think the questions that people started asking almost immediately were really the right questions. They were the very same questions that our friend Tim Hafey uh, volunteered to ask uh, for a cost. I understand that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, got the opportunity to ask the questions around the why and the how and what got us to that point. Why weren't we better prepared for it? Um, why did things happen the way that they, they did, whether it be the convergence of two very different groups uh, in a public place, the tr- tremendous, tragic death of uh, of one of our people. Um, those are the they were those were the right questions to ask, and those were the answers that citizens deserve then and they deserve now. And um, I, I hope that one of the things we can do as we look back on those tragic events is to uh, really understand the importance of preparation for something that is inevitable and will happen again. I think those events were foreseeable, and I think the the efforts fell less than this community deserved, and certainly for the men and women of the police department. They deserved more. Tim, one of the takeaways that I got from the, the Hafey report, I think the most glaring was, was about the chief, Al Thomas, who has since uh, retired. Um, but the other real takeaway, I think, that was there, and it was in the, the state reports as well, was we got to figure out how the state police and sure. local municipal police forces, we have to figure out how to plan together better, how they can communicate better. I mean, the, the, what was revealed in that report was just, it just makes you slap your forehead like, oh, my Lord, 
what uh, just such a lack of of co-planning and being on the same page together at a time when they desperately needed to be on the same page together as you're saying w- w- this violence was predictable sure mm-hmm. yeah there's there's i mean there there's never been a greater importance for collaboration around what would was likely the most critical event we've seen in this community in a very long time. I've worked over the years, had the privilege of working over the years with many different law enforcement agencies uh, to deal with um, issues that came up in our community. And certainly the search for Hannah was was probably one of the largest uh, ground searches of its kind in this the history of the Commonwealth. And that wasn't accomplished simply by the Charlottesville Police yeah. Department. Well, that's where I was going next. Abemarle. That's where I was going next, because what a... What a beautiful example of collaboration! Yeah. And I was over there at the, you know, at the, the National, armory, at the sure. armory out on out on uh, Avon Extended many many times, and saw firsthand what that collaboration looks like. And you want to talk about people who are on the same page and all pulling in the same direction at the same time, and everybody knew what the other part was doing, and and uh, we didn't see that in August. Yeah. Well, again, you know, I wasn't I wasn't in the room for the planning. I wasn't in the room during the execution. I can tell you what it appeared, and the the the, the absence of meaningful, effective communication certainly was apparent. The absence of any collaborative planning certainly was apparent. The presence of two perhaps disparate operational plans appeared to be present. Uh, and uh, no single unified command, which is absolutely critical in executing an operation that has so many moving parts. Somebody needed to be in charge so that when the critical task needed to take place, and the, frankly the entire event, in my opinion, constituted a critical task. But the critical task around dispersal was so important that that had to be well-constructed and well-led and it didn't appear that that was the case. And perhaps there are very good, very logical reasons why that was not the, the case. But I, I saw the same things that other folks in this community saw by way of video footage, um, both both in real time, um, but also after the fact. And it didn't bode well for this community. I had the opportunity. In fact, it was a privilege to go to Georgetown and speak uh, with several others uh, in one of the most uh, extraordinary historical auditoriums, not only uh, at Georgetown, but on college campuses around this country. Uh, lots of important discussions occurred uh, in this auditorium, have occurred over in, at this auditorium over, over the years pertaining to the history of this country. And I was accompanied by um, the, the gentleman who actually started Black Lives Matter. I was joined by a, a member of the ACLU, I was joined by a United States District Court Judge, uh, Sandy Unger, who uh, was the, previously the president of Goucher College in Baltimore and uh, hosted uh, a very popular show on NPR for many years. Sandy was our moderator. And we kicked off this discussion with hundreds, hundreds of, pre- of folks present with a four- to five-minute video of, of August the 12th. And it was shameful. And the people in the audience that had never seen that video, that depicted the violence and the hatred that our, our, our families saw, that our officers saw, was just deplorable. They were shocked by what they saw. And fortunately, I'm grateful for Sandy for looking to me first. And he said, Tim, how do you react to that? My first statement was, that's not my house. That's not Charlottesville. Yeah, it's not the Charlottesville. That is not the character of my community. And um, it's disheartening to, to look at that and know that there are people around this country that, is ne- that have never stepped foot in this community who are thinking very differently about the place, Coy, that you and I yeah, and your yeah. listeners call home. Well, they don't know they don't that know. all these alt-right guys were bust in no, and drove know. from all over the country to be here. They don't know that a lot of the black-clad Antifa kids, I call them kids, most of them were kids, who were in the street counter-protesting, a lot of them weren't from here. But we're still left with um, the people who had the authority and the opportunity to maintain the safety of this community fell short. And that's also yeah. what people see. How should we make sense of the the criticism the local police got after the KKK rally? You you, you guys were too heavy handed when yeah. you were trying to clear uh, was it Jefferson Street or whatever it was. You were too heavy handed. And then a few weeks later, August 12th comes. And they get even more criticism. Well, you didn't do enough. Well, but you they, did too much. You didn't do enough. They, they were completely—they were completely two separate events. Yeah, they presented 
very different risks. I think the, and again, I'm, I'm speculating. You know, I wasn't present during uh, closed doors uh, conversations about planning, but it appeared to me that the potential for violence, the intelligence that pointed to the potential for violence, and the numbers of people who would come to this community with that on their mind were far more significant than what the community may have anticipated in July. Yeah. So, And I think that required a different level, more sophisticated level, more strategic level of preparedness because it was going to be a plan that would be executed, I would think, somewhat differently. And arguably we saw that around the country in other places like Boston when, when the alt-right went to have other rallies. But, but you know what's so funny that a lot of people don't understand? The, the alt-right rallies which followed Charlottesville weren't as violent although they had some violence in San Francisco, but that was because of Antifa, which took over a park. And the, the liberal mayor of San Francisco said Antifa is a gang. These, these are radical leftists, and we have to treat them like a gang, but that's another topic. But a lot of people don't understand that what made Charlottesville so unique was what Jason Kessler was intentionally trying to do. If you look at the name of the rally, Unite the Right, they were doing something that hadn't been done before. They were pulling together all of these different groups who usually rally alone. That's why the, that's why August 12th was called Unite the Right, because the alt-right was reaching out to the KKK and the National Socialists, the Nazis, and all these groups who don't usually rally together. They were different groups, and they came separately. That's why it was called Unite the Right. And that's what made Charlottesville different, and I think that was a particular toxic mix of their own making, that they had never experienced before, because they'd never done anything like this before. Yeah, it was a perfect example of a, of a, a collaboration upon, uh, around a common cause that had led to dramatic results. Uh, there's a couple other things, I think, that were different. Boston is an interesting uh, community that you've pointed out, and that, you know, in, in the state of Massachusetts, my understanding is don't have any specific... Uh, laws pertaining to the kinds of things that come into these types of demonstrations right, that right. could be characterized as weapons. But they also don't prohibit localities from having those kinds of rules in effect. And Virginia does. And, and I think, I, I think uh, my understanding is that the city of Boston had a pretty clear set of guidelines that their officers were aware of, that they were trained on, that they anticipated that there are certain things that will not come into this discussion. Um, that could present a higher risk to the people who come here to peaceably protest, yeah, yeah. to express their views in a way that's consistent with the Constitution. They weren't allowed to go into their rally with the with the sticks and the no. shields and the guns. No. And the, in Virginia, you, the, Richmond tells localities like Charlottesville, you can't stop people from rallying with that stuff. Well, I know there was some discussion about whether the laws were or were not interpreted with respect to the preparation for what folks could or could not be anticipated to bring into that event. But... If that misunderstanding was present on August the twelfth, it was certainly present long before then, which suggests to me that the officers may not been may not have been sufficiently prepared. The plan may not have sufficiently addressed what are we going to do within within the meaning of the law to prevent the potential for this level of violence yeah. by precluding people from coming in a manner that certainly more than suggests their willingness to participate in violent acts. You know, it's amazing to think of, and I'm sure you've thought of this. It's, it's actually pretty amazing more people didn't die on that day. I mean, there were people, the guy who fired his handgun, you know, they, I can't remember his name, but he, sure. he walks down out of the park. The one guy, counter protester, standing there uh, shooting fire at him and, and uh, nearly burns these people. And he turns around in response and fires his weapon. That, that bullet could have gone in someone's skull. I mean, it very easily could have killed someone right there. Oh, yeah, there was uh, also opportunities for uh, that round to ricochet. You, I, there's no way of knowing the trajectory of that round necessarily from the video, but the first thing that came to mind when that, when I when I saw that was exactly your point: was how did someone not get hurt? Right, right. How was someone yeah. not hit by that round? But also, how is it that no one returned fire? <laughs> Which was shocking to me that you know he he did what he did and he walked away. Yeah. And uh, by the grace of God first and good fortune second, to your point, uh, no one else was hurt. Uh, The death of one person is too much. We're talking with Tim Longo. He's the former chief of the city of Charlottesville Police Department for many years. 
What is your thinking when you hear people saying, I was, and again, you were not part of the planning. Mm. I'm not looking for you to, to explain the thinking behind the scenes. You weren't there. But as somebody who, who has hired and fired police officers, as somebody who has led a great department, as somebody who now goes around the country teaching police officers, what, are you, what crosses your mind when you hear so many people desperately say on video, they're, they're beating us and the police are doing nothing? And there's videotape of you know, people getting beaten, the fight's going on, and police just watching and not keeping the peace. How should, how should we make sense of that? I don't Aside know. from clearly there was some planning that didn't happen or really missed the mark. Is there a way to understand going forward? So not just Charlotte's, but other communities. What should we do? How, how can communities better have a conversation with their police departments so this doesn't happen again? Well, I, I think one of the conversations that may have been lost going into this event was, you know, we all, all of us, um, local officials, the local governing representatives in this case, the police being only one part, I might add, but the larger community, I don't know what the discussion around expectation was what the expectation of the community was with respect to when things happen. Department, city, what can we expect from you in the way of a response, particularly if this becomes violent? Because there are going to be legitimate concerns the department's going to have with respect to the safety of their own personnel. Mm -hmm. There are going to be issues around capacity and abilities to be able to respond in situations where chaos is in in, um is in place, uh, but by the same token, there's a public expectation that when violence erupts, that the police are going to respond, that they're going to take steps that are reasonably calculated to preserve safety. And when that doesn't happen, people are left with not only disappointment, beyond disappointment, but the question of how this failure was allowed to take place. And one of the ironies, of course, is some of the sharpest criticism against police officers and against what they're trying to do comes from, for lack of a better word, comes from the radical left or democratic socialists who are at the same time saying, well, we don't need police. We need to get rid of the police. I mean, it's one of their agenda items is they want to defund police departments. And yet they're also very, very sharply critical when the police don't respond when they're getting beaten in the street. You know, I think it's, I think it's a naive discussion to have that in our lifetime, in the lifetime of our children, that you're going to live in a world, in a country where the police are not going to be present. So the question then becomes, with that reality, how do we better collaborate with the police so the police policies and strategies comply with the Constitution, with the understanding that the Constitution is the floor, it's not the ceiling, and that policing strategies are consistent with community expectations in ways that will keep communities safe, communities safe, and not run the risk of compromising the constitutional rights of citizens. You know, when we look at things like August the 12th and the violence against police and, and in which police are alleged to have been involved over the past several years, uh, it raises the question it's, as to whether it's an encouraging time to be a cop in America. I ask a different question as I travel around the country. And really, it's more of a statement. There's never been a greater opportunity to rethink policing in this country to do a better job of communicating with citizens about expectations around policing strategies in ways that will make communities safer, but will also begin to fix this fracture between police community and community relation. And And you see that as one of the great takeaways of August 12th in Charlottesville. uh, Among other things, yeah. yeah, is, is Let's see this for the opportunity that it brings to our community and communities throughout this country to rethink policing strategies and ways, again, to advance public safety, but to restore public trust in communities where it's been so um, so, jeopard- so jeopardized. What's been your reaction, again, as a, a citizen of Charlottesville on your front porch to what, what I see personally, just me watching this, having reported on and watched Charlottesville City Council meetings for almost 30 years now? What's your reaction to the sort of the decay of civility, and, and which was happening before August twelfth? I mean, you can yeah. go back and look at the video of the right. meetings. They uh, they did not want Jason Kessler before August twelfth to be able to actually speak. 
at a city council meeting because they saw it as the city empowering him to be heard. Right. Uh, you know, real anti-free speech and ridiculing others. And, of course, Jim Hingley went to city council and got booed just right. because he said, can't we can't we be civil here and respect free speech? And they booed him down. Um Hopefully it'll quiet down now that we've had a change of leadership in the city. But you well, know, we'll see. Yeah, you we'll know, see. We'll, we'll see. Because at the end of the day, the city has to govern. The people behind that dais have to govern. They have to have the opportunity to govern. They need to advance the interests of this community, and that cannot be interrupted. Having said that, I think what this signals and should signal is the tremendous frustration and anger from citizens that they're not being heard, and the gloves have come off. And they will do what they need to do uh, in a way that I hope is consistent with our Constitution and, and the court cases that have interpreted its meaning. But they'll do what they can do uh, in an effort to be heard and to see the kinds of results that they think are the best in the best interest, the, the long term best interest of this community, results that are not just temporary, that are not just undertaken to satisfy the moment, but are sustainable over time that will change the culture of the community in such a way that these these terribly old wounds that get picked open from time to time when things occur finally begin to heal. All, all of what we see is, system, is symptomatic of generations of pain. And uh, as I was having lunch with a visiting professor uh, who's recently come to our community to do, to do good work around public policy and policing, the history informs the present, and to think anything else is, is naive. And you got to look at you got to look at history when you think about policy and strategies, and that's where the collaboration becomes important. And I hope that that's what we see as our police department um, begins to move forward. I, you know, my heart went out to you know the young men and women, the line officers, who were called upon to execute a plan. Um, th- they too um, suffered. Um, I think the disappointment uh, and, and tragedies that took place. But I'll say it's an opportunity for them now to um, to, to see a rebirth in leadership, Yeah. Uh, but also collaboration with the community that they've committed to serve. And I hope that that's what happens. Maybe and, I'm the naive one, Coy. And, <laughs> well, and I should say in an effort, and I want to repeat this again. I've said this many times on the radio and on Facebook, but there's a lot of video evidence of police officers stepping in on august 12th and separating people and i mean there's i don't want there to be this history to inherit this narrative that the police did nothing right now arguably we can say they didn't do enough when they could have done something that's true i think and that's the result of a plan it's not result of any one police officer saying screw you i'm not gonna i think they were following a plan and that's the issue here but there's also many instances on video where you can see them, where they sure. step in, they're pushing yeah. people apart, yeah. they're, yeah, they're, 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 you know, yeah, they're, they're doing you know, what they're, they can, I guess. Well, there are decisions that officers make uh, every day in the exercise of their duties, sometimes that may um, be in contradiction to a plan. Yeah. Because in their heart and minds, it's the right thing to do. Uh, and it's, it's the thing that's consistent with their overall mission, and that is to keep people safe. Um, I, th- I think there's, I don't want to be a dead horse here, but I think there's there's an opportunity for some goodness to come from this um, as we move forward. Uh, and to and, make, yeah. is, it, ahead, is it fair to say that what we're seeing in Charlottesville now, aside from August 12th, which was a bit unique for, not just for Charlottesville, but for America, to see something that violent and that, are you seeing this around the country when you go into other communities? Are you seeing other countries are dealing, they're dealing with this too. They're also dealing with generations of pain oh, and sure. people you know trying to be heard and trying to affect change and communities st- really struggling sometimes together to 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 slog their way forward to some measure of progress and peace no i think so and it you know august 12th is just it's one event in our history not just the history of this city but now the history of america but it's just one event. It's tragic and it's painful and as destructive as it was, as unthinkable as it was, it's one event in history where we can say this is just another example of why we need to step back and begin to rethink some of what we do 
to, to make our community safer in ways, as again, that are consistent with our Constitution, but also in line with the expectations of the people that we serve. Yeah. And to make sure as we go about our operational strategies that from time to time that, that, that they exceed the requirements of our Constitution. That's what I mean when I say it's the ceiling, not the floor. But also to be thoughtful that we don't engage in practices or put forth plans that either create or enhance the danger to our community as we go about our work. And I'm not suggesting that that's what happened, but it's certainly something that people, I think, have on their mind. I I think what I've said this to you before, but I think one of the greatest aspects of your legacy, and you're still a young man, you've got a lot of legacy to write. I but, hope so. Uh, aside from Hannah Graham, aside from some of the big headlines and the Rolling Stone and Martise Johnson and all the things that w- that happened when you were chief of police in Charlottesville, but you have you are one of the national leaders now encouraging this country to rethink policing to to really be thoughtful and measured about i don't think reinvent is the right word but about f- really you know putting our our shoulders to the wheel to figure out how can we do this better how mm. can we do this better and and what does that look like in your day to day that effort trying to encourage people to have this conversation, to rethink policing, what would you like them to do? Besides well, conversations like this on the radio. To- <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that, that I've, I've been working on at the University of Virginia in the School of Continuing and Professional Studies is to, the construction of what we hope will someday be a master's program in public safety. Now we're in the process of going through a time-honored approval process that will result in eventually this proposal coming before the State Commission on Higher Education, who, if we're fortunate enough to, to have this proposal accepted and this proposal to, to begin as a master's program, th- these are the very things we'll be discussing. Right, right. The constitutional framework of policing, how to balance policing strategy with public expectations, how to create and sustain community dialogue, uh, because all those things are important in revisiting how we rethink this work. And so I, I hope the balance of my life um, will be focused on leading a conversation and hope that others will follow as to how we go about the work of rethinking. And, I, and I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that um, our university uh, is, is embracing this notion that my colleagues around the country who I continue to collaborate with uh, embrace this notion at police chiefs, very good um, police chiefs around this country, one of which will be visiting us on February the 6th. We're having a panel at the law school uh, around the state of community policing uh, and the history of police reform. Uh, retired police commissioner Chuck Ramsey, who started his career in Chicago, will be here with me. Chuck's a dear friend and a police leader. He served as a police chief in our nation's capital in the city of Philadelphia. Would have been one of the people I would have had to the table to prepare for, for August 12th. Uh, Joe Brand, who's the first cops, uh, community and policing service director under President Clinton, the very first in the country, a pioneer in community policing and a, um, a very respected police, retired police chief in California will be here to talk about this issue. Our own Professor Rachel Harmon of the law school, mm-hmm. who has a long history of studying policing strategies and policing reform will be here. And last but not least, um, my old and dear friend, uh, Police Chief Bernadette DePino from Sarasota, Florida, who is probably one of the most progressive police chiefs in the country, will be here to talk about how do we embrace this notion of relational policing and advance it forward in the 21st century. And this is an event at the law school at the University of Virginia that you've put together with people from around the country. Um, is this a public event? And this is just around the corner. Yeah, well, we... Um, it, it, you know, it's in the Kaplan Pavilion, which is is only so large. So right. I suspect we're going to have a lot of students and faculty there. To the extent the um, facility allows for, yes, as folks walk through the door, they're welcome to attend. We built this around educating students on campus, faculty, uh, and, and frankly, to kind of preview the, the, the very things we'll be talking about if we're privileged enough to, to have this proposal advance to the next level. So in this proposal, again, I want to underscore that because... This is really special and comes out of all the work and all the things you've learned in policing and coming up in Baltimore and then Charlottesville. Is this a unique thing or are other schools doing this? Or? Uh, there are universities around the country that have master's uh, level programs around issues of criminal justice. I, 
you know, I think what makes this discussion different is, different is we're we're focusing on those aspects of policing that will never change, that should never change, that will make the difference to 21st century policing being implemented successfully in communities. And and one of the one of the courses that um, I'm working closely with a a brilliant young professor at the Curry School, uh, Rachel Wall, is about how do you have hard conversations around contentious issues with with community, how do you talk about race in a community? How do you talk? How do you talk about police community relations in a way that's going to result in change? How do you create and sustain effective community dialogue? That's a that's a huge discussion, and I'm not sure it gets taught in police academies. Yeah, I'm not sure to the extent we have police chief schools, it gets much much airtime. But it's going to be a semester course, so we're going to spend a lot of time talking to but this cohort know, about. Yeah, but as you know, is when they get on the job, police chiefs all across the country, this is one of the things they have to figure out how to do. Absolutely. How do I engage successfully with the public so that I can have a public meeting that's not just people screaming at right. each other? You gotta, and that requires uh, building social capital. That requires understanding that relationships are the most important aspect of community policing, which is why I call it relational policing. If you don't have that relationship, you're not going to have that discussion. Because we don't have that relationship immediately, there's no trust. There's no trust, there's never going to be communication. And that's hard work. It's hard work when you live in a place where there's old wounds, where there are people that are highly distrustful of government generally, and specifically the most visible part of its local government, which oftentimes are the police. And you got to acknowledge that. you got to embrace it. That's what, that, that's what I mean when I say history informs the present, which informs the future. If you don't understand it, you don't accept it, you don't embrace it, you're not willing to talk about it, the trust and the communication will never come about. I've learned a lot in 30-some-odd years. I've made tons of mistakes as a police chief. I continue to make much, many mistakes as a human being. Um, I'm a flawed person, um, but I've learned a lot. And I want to I wanna pass that on. I want, when I'm dead and gone... <laughs> I don't want my legacy to be I sat at 606 East Market Street and was the police chief. I wanted to be part of something that communicated a message around this country of how to make policing better and that that legacy outlived me for a very long time. I'm reminded of a photograph that was in your office when you were chief of you as a young beat cop in a bad neighborhood in uh, in Baltimore on a, on a stoop talking yeah. to a woman. Remember that like yesterday. Out on, out on her step. And whenever I hear you talk about relational policing, community policing, and how we should really be focused as a country on engaging in a dialogue with our local police forces so that they can do that better, which is better for everybody. It's better for them, better for us, it's better for our rights, it's better for our communities. I always think of that picture. To me, that's the picture of you as a young beat cop in, in Baltimore talking to this woman in inner city Baltimore, having a conversation on the job, because that's what it is, right? It's I mean, everything. It's, the job's the job's about people. It always has been, and it always will be. And if you can't take the time to engage, just to t- people want to talk. They want a relationship. They, you know, you're going to have to break through some barriers. But at the end of the, the, the day, we all want the same thing. We want to be safe. We want to be respected. We want to be treated fairly. We want to be heard. We want to be cared for. We want to be loved. We want to, we want to know that we are, we're part of something that makes a difference and that will make a difference for generations to come. That, that, that's a community expectation that everyone should share, but it requires trust and communication. The only way that's going to come about is through relationship. And the only way that's going to happen is taking the time to stop and have a conversation. And to a certain extent, we're swimming against the tide here because there is a larger culture in policing mm-hmm. in America, especially now after decades of the war on drugs. That's all about militarization and control. And it, some police forces have become like occupying armies in, in some of these poor neighborhoods. And it's Well, when you look at cities like Chicago, uh, where people die every day in violent crime, and now you're the police superintendent or you're a police commander, you're a cop on a beat. And you're being asked, okay, balance the strategies to fix the violence against the need to restore public trust, counterbalance with community expectations, and get it right. 
Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> yeah, that's hard work. But yeah. here's the reality. But is it? But it's you're saying it's not necessary work. And you're saying it's not impossible. Absolutely, it's not impossible. It can't be impossible. Impossibility cannot be something we accept because we got to do those two things. We absolutely have to do those two things. It can't be one way or the other. It cannot. And and I think. And again, perhaps I'm speaking out of school. When we talk about the war on drugs, understand for many beat cops like me in Baltimore, it was really about stopping that shooting on a street corner on my post. I don't want another person to get yeah. murdered on my post. I don't want another person to get shot on my post. I don't want another person to carry a gun on my post. And every one of those things had to do with the drug market. So in my head, it wasn't I'm fighting a war on drugs. I'm fighting a war on violent crime. And it just so happens... It's encouraged by drugs. And so what happened along the way and how that happens is you got a governing body that's saying reduce the homicide rate, knock down the shootings, keep people from getting shot on the streets. And that's the message. And oh, by the way, at the same time, build a few relationships. That, that, yeah. that part was left out. <laughs> right, right. You know, <laughs> so, the poor young cop, 1983, 1984, is, is strolling through the Murphy homes with one thing on his mind. Pray and hope nobody gets shot on your post tonight and do what you can to make sure that don't happen. And we didn't talk enough about and understand that good people live here. Yeah. That the vast majority of people here aren't carrying a gun. They're not thinking about shooting anybody. They're thinking about how not to get shot. And they're looking for you to protect them. And you better know who they are. Because they can be good to you. And one thing you've learned since the early 80s <laughs> is that creating relationships with those I people you have can help you bring down the crime that you're trying to fight. They'll talk to you. They'll tell you that, yeah. that you know, they may not do it on the front steps. Right, right, right. But they'll find a way to do it <laughs> because they'll trust you. And they'll know your heart's pure and they'll know your intentions are good. Yeah. And they'll understand that you're, that you're, that what you've tried to do is not to coerce them, but to partner with them. And uh, that sounds kind of pie in the sky, maybe a little naive. And for some cop that might be listening, this guy has lost touch with reality a long time ago. But that's what I think. That's what my heart tells me. And it worked for me. And it can work for the future of American policing. And violent crime is down in America, across America, as, as, as at least as far as national stats are concerned. Right. Uh, and, and it is safer for, for police officers who go out on the beat. It's still a deadly job, and they still take their life into their own hands every single time they go out to try to keep these neighborhoods safe. That said, the numbers say that violent crime is down in America. Yeah, I think we make a mistake. First of all, we have to acknowledge. I mean, I have dear friends who have lost their lives in the execution of their public duties. I have dear friends who have family, one who lives right here in this community who touches my heart every time I think about the sacrifice her brother made on behalf of the community that he served. I, it, I get the danger, and I think we have to acknowledge that, but I think what gets lost in the translation is that's really not what make, makes this job different. What makes this job incredibly different is the power and the trust and the expectations that are afforded to us uh, and the opportunities we have to exercise authority over those things in ways that won't just make community safer, but restore trust. That's what makes the job different. We have a tremendous amount of power and authority that will help, if exercised properly, change the way people look at the business. Yeah. And that's what I hope. And here we are in 2018, just to wrap up here, as you say, with a, such a tremendous opportunity to rethink policing to make it better. And one of those efforts is, as you say, you're engaged at the University of Virginia now, working to hopefully create a new master's program that will do just this, that will bring people together to sit in a room and talk about how do we make policing better? Right. What do you need to know as a future chief of police in your town? How do you, what are the tools you need? What's your skill set that you're going to need that they didn't teach you in the police academy? that you need to engage with a community, to engage with the public, perhaps engage with the media, uh, and and learn this skill set that's going to save lives. It's going to make communities safer. The other beauty of the program, I hope, is that we're dealing with a small cohort that not only will the the education come from in front of the room, but it'll come from the person who's sitting next to you who may work in a very different community, who may have been part of things that worked very successfully there that you could take back to your neck of the woods and employ. So there's that that beauty of having that cohort together 
um, talking about these issues that is, uh, but also bringing the experience to the table, their own personal and practical life experience and job experience when we talk about these important issues. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Coy. You're a good friend. I really, yes, I really sir. appreciate Likewise. you making time. I know you're, you're one of the busiest people in Charlottesville right now, and I really do appreciate it. Thanks for your time. And thank you for everybody in this town for, for all you do and that you continue to do. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You've been listening to the Citizens Band Radio Hour, a production of the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. Archived podcasts are available online at mediaandcitizenship.org. The executive producers for the program are Siva Vadianathan and Koi Barefoot.